Chris, Chris must be involved in the West Ham ways after the 2005 race, when there, were, there were a number of issues and a number of problems. And Dario, who, who was uh, the race director, as most of you will know for, for that period, but very carefully how he addressed these. Chris was the GP and came up even and became involved. And I have to say, his support advice to the race has been completely invaluable and gives us and the committee a great deal of comfort that we're doing things well. Chris, if I could hand over to you, I'll be pleased to go on your presentation. Can you hear me or do I need the gizmo? I'll say, you can hear me. Okay, if you can, then I'll use the gizmo. Listen, thanks very much for that billing. It didn't sound like anyone I know, but uh, <laughs> that's the guy I know. So, uh, uh, as, as Ian said, I've been involved since 2005, and my involvement in 2005 was uh, posthumous, if you like, um, which uh, followed the um, overloading of the Belford Hospital with West Highland Way race uh, carnage. Uh, and uh, I, phoned, uh, I phoned Dario, uh, who I didn't know. You can't hear me? Okay. Did you hear any of that? Did you hear any of that? You can hear me now. I start off by saying uh, I'm struggling to recognise anyone in that billing, but I do recognise the guy in the photo. <laughs> so, as Ian said, I, I became involved in 2005 uh, um, after the event. Uh, following the uh, filling up of Belford Hospital with the West Highland Way race uh, carnage. Uh, and I took it upon myself to find out why those people were in there and uh, inform the uh, race organiser. Uh, and for my troubles, uh, I didn't get a goblet that year, uh, but I did get a, a load of subsequent work, which I've been very happy to have. So I'm a GP in Kinoch Leven, and I, uh, under, under the NHS I've been able to do a fair whack of uh, sports medicine too. Uh, and every year I say the same, that uh, I hope uh, that all of you will be running past the kidney leaf surgery and none of you will be coming in it. Nevertheless, that's an arrogant assumption because casualties do happen and you don't have to look far to, uh, to find evidence of those. And uh, clearly there was one at White Hart Lane uh, this weekend. So they do happen and, and those are just a few, whether from mythology or from, uh, from the media. There are reports of mishaps from running along the way. Uh, and hopefully, by the time the evening's out, we've got an idea about a few of those causes. So, the disorders that I thought we might run through tonight in whistle stop fashion are those summarised um, uh, in this table. But uh, the first uh, uh, um, problems are those related to sudden death. Uh, then there are some extreme variations of normal which manifest themselves potentially in some worrying way. And then there are some disease process, processes which might affect you systemically or might cause localised problems. So with regard to sudden cardiac death, uh, to sudden death, uh, most of the causes of being cardiac, these are fortunately uh, un uh, uncommon. Uh, and when they do arise, uh, shooting the cause to be cardiac, then there's a rule of thumb, uh, the cardiac cause is governed by age. Uh, for those under 35 years of age, the, the cause is likely to be some form of hereditary cardiac defect. And for those over 35 years of age, uh, then the cause is more likely to be uh, an acquired occlusion of the coronary arteries. And I've deliberately uh, kept those pictures as old ones, and I'm sure we've both been with more recent uh, photographs that might fit those uh, slots. So, with, moving on now from sudden death to the, uh, the extreme variations of normal physiology which you might encounter. This is by far and away the most common, and we've already heard about it uh, from the previous speaker, this phenomenon of fainting at the, at the end of the event. Uh, and it, it, uh, it's a simple phenomenon. Uh, it's, it's not recognised what it is, and it's often over-treated. Uh, and it's a consequence of running a long way or exercising for a long period of time, using the muscles of the legs to help return blood from the periphery to the heart, and then suddenly stopping exercising and that return of blood no longer happens. If no blood returns to the heart, then there's no blood for the heart to pump out and you'll faint. But if you put light people down uh, for a period of a few minutes, they will respond uh, and come good. Okay? So there are certain features which enable you to, should enable you to recognise this phenomenon uh, with relative certainty. That you're running across the line feeling completely well, and then after a short period of minutes, 
will be uh, uh, unroused with the line on the floor. Uh, there will be no other symptoms, uh, and uh, after a further few minutes, if you leave them where they are, they will come good. And those are the features of this uh, essentially benign phenomenon, although we haven't seen it, and you're seeing it for the first time, there's a potential to worry. And uh, if you speak to Sean, he saw nine in one year. Uh, uh, you, get, you do get used to seeing it and recognizing it. And there's no doubt that it's most common uh, at the last stage, and that probably relates to the finishing spurt. But I've seen quite a few in Kenan um, Lehman. So bear this rule of thumb in mind that if the, if the collapse is shortly after finishing the race on the stage, then it's usually as phenomenon. And if, it, if the collapse uh, is associated with other symptoms, uh, while you are running, or substantially after running, then it's much more likely to be something serious. Now, having uh, put that rule of thumb, which I think all people in my position would subscribe to, I have little doubt that there, there have been some late collapses associated with this race. And there, were the, there was an incident a few years ago where someone got up for pee in the middle of the night, collapsed in the lavatory, fell, uh, sustaining a chest injury on the lavatory floor, broke a rib, punctured the lung, and ended up in hospital. But uh, I have little doubt that the initial phenomenon which caused the collapse was a late manifestation of this. But I don't think that's what you should be thinking. If you encounter someone who collapses substantially after the event, err on the side of caution. And there was another last, there was another similar event last year where someone who hadn't been feeling too good went home in the back of his own camper van, got home uh, on standing to get out of the camper van, uh, proceeded to collapse a long way out of my jurisdiction. And quite recently an ambulance was summoned. But I, again, I think that was a late variation of this. But the rule of thumb, uh, if, this, if this is happening substantially after the event, err on the side of caution. So then the next common phenomenon is an elevation of body temperature. And here are some figures deliberately taken from the Singapore Half Marathon. And I've, I've used uh, that event because the data is the most dramatic. And as you can see, there's a runner here whose core temperature has risen to nearly 42 degrees and, and is feeling completely wet. Well. Um, you won't see that in the West Highland Way race for two reasons. First of all, that because the race is so much longer, the level of exertion of the, of the runners of the race is such uh, that the body temperature won't rise. And the other uh, contributory factor to uh, a rise in core temperature is the ambient conditions, uh, which clearly are in Northern Scotland and not those of Singapore. So I'm just using that slide to make a point that the core temperature could rise normally and is not associated with any disease process as a result of exertion. Okay, uh, so you need to discern, should you measure someone's core temperature, and I don't suppose any of uh, you guys would do that, but you don't want to get bogged down. Uh, imagine you had a combination of two factors, the one that we've just discussed, whereby somebody collapses, then ends up having a temperature measured, which is uh, found to be high, and before you go, you've got a diagnosis of uh, heat stroke, when all you've got is a combination of two innocent phenomena. So we're already getting the idea that it's quite hard to discern exactly what's going on. Uh, but innocent eventualities are the more common. The next, the next phenomenon that, uh, that is universal is some degree of muscle damage. Uh, and here are some measurements that I did with uh, a couple of colleagues in 2009 where healthy finishers uh, had their uh, blood muscle enzyme measured. And uh, as you can see, uh, over, two, over 200 would be deemed abnormal. Under other circumstances, you might be starting to worry. All these people are well, uh, and, and we've got a higher level. You've got a highest level of 133,000, um, uh, which, if you weren't familiar with this eventuality, you might think there was something very wrong. Now, I re remember this this individual, and it's clearly the individual whose muscles ache most at the end of the run. But, <laughs> but otherwise, there was nothing to indicate there was anything amiss, and all these people. Uh, recovered uh, and eventually. Um, so it's important to appreciate that there is an element of muscle damage which is detectable in everybody uh, if you look. Uh, but from these people, occasionally some complication arises, and we'll be hearing a bit more about that in a minute. The next phenomenon which is normal is weight loss. Uh, and it's important that you appreciate that, that weight loss is not the same as dehydration. So it is normal in these long events. To, to find that you lose somewhere between 2 and 4% of your starting weight. And it's important that you realise that that is not 2 to 4% dehydration. 
Um, time permits, if you're interested, I'll explain why percent weight loss and percent dehydration are not the same. But we'll see how we go for time, and I'll just accept that for, me, for the time being. So here are some measurements uh, of healthy finishes uh, from the same year, 2009. And despite the difficulties in weighing people at the West Highland Way uh, race, it's hard to get uh, people who are feeling well uh, in the middle of the night who've got extra layers on from when they have their initial weighing uh, to take all those clothes off to be weighing the same things as when, you, as when they started, just for the sake of uh, my information. But you still get the idea that the best fit line uh, through those 60, uh, 66 health finishes does indicate, uh, as found in other races throughout the world, uh, just over 2%. And this is normal uh, and maybe even well, desirable. Are you bamboozled by these graphs? I'll try and explain. Here, here are two graphs. One our own figures from 2009, and the other, and the other graph are figures from uh, two consecutive South African Ironmans by uh, uh, from Charlotte, which plot uh, finishing time in minutes against percent change in body weight. So the two graphs both show the same thing, uh, that uh, as, body, as, as you use more body weight, uh, your finishing time improves. Now I'm very careful as to how to sell that to you. I'm not advocating that you starve yourself and fluid restrict yourself in order to produce a better time. What I am saying is that those people who by natural disposition can cope with a with relative degrees of fluid loss, seem to be able to run good times. Okay, is that message clear? <laughs> Do not starve yourself and fluid deplete yourself to improve your time. But if you are a natural who can cope with, good, with substantial degrees of fluid loss, you would like to be also someone who will run a good time. Okay, so there's an element of suggestion that uh, losing weight is associated with a uh, uh, better finishing time. Okay. Here's another graph, which I hope, again, is not overwhelming. I will try and explain it. Unfortunately, the direction on the bottom line of weight change is the opposite from the previous graph. So remember the previous graph, that uh, weight loss uh, went towards me and weight gain went away from me. Uh, unfortunately, on this one, the direction of the weight change is the other way. Okay, and it plots weight change against finishing sodium. Now, here, are the hello, 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 hello. Is this still working? How's that? Good. Okay. So here's a here's a watch of uh, normal sodiums in most of the finishes. And as you can see, these, these sodium levels are associated with people who tend to have lost between about 2 and 5% of their starting weight. So the second uh, association with weight loss is the fact that your sodium when you finish is most likely to be normal. Uh, again, I sell that with caution, that uh, disturbances of sodium, both elevations and depressions, are seen at both extremities of weight loss, uh, both extremities of weight change. But as a general trend, those who lose weight, those who lose weight will have normal or possibly high sodiums, and those who gain weight are more likely to have low sodiums. And it's low sodium, which as you'll hear shortly, is more damaging than high. So two, two favorable associations with weight loss, and again I'm reinforced, weight loss is not the same, not the same as dehydration. Two favourable associations. One is a good, better finishing time, and the other is protection against the damaging low sodium. Okay, so that's uh, all I'm going to say about uh, extreme variations of normal, uh, and the rest of the talk concerns uh, defi definitely abnormal or what I would call pathological entities. And here is the first one. Um, here's one of a number of casualties uh, in the history of long distance running from, uh, from the London Marathon in 2007. But he's certainly not alone. Um, it's those who, who have died, uh, and substantially more who have had this phenomenon who haven't died. And we've seen that in the West Highland race, way race, most notably in 2005. So the phenomenon, as the name suggests, there must be a gap between associated and hyperlipidemia. As the name suggests, is a low blood sodium 
and it's important that you appreciate what the cause of the low sodium is. This is a dilutional phenomenon where your sodium is diluted by excessive watery fluid. It is not a phenomenon of loss of sodium. Uh, depending on which literature you read, you may find, particularly in the American literature, there is more emphasis that the low sodium uh, may be due to the sodium lost in sweat. But in the rest of the world, the, it's quite clear that we think, uh, and I subscribe to that view, that the low sodium phenomenon is a dilutional one. And that's why drinking too much water is, is uh, so damaging. So drink what your body tells you you need not what you think you should be drinking, or not what any guideline tells you. Rehearse your fluid loss, monitor your weight, know what you need, drink uh, according to how you feel, and stick to that. The difficulty with low sodium is that in the early stages, the symptoms are non-specific and just make you a bit muddled. And there's many a muddled finisher in this race who hasn't got a low sodium. But nevertheless, it is an invitation to think about it. And certainly as the symptoms progress to fits, then that's a pretty strong pointer. Okay. By the time the individual is comatose, then that can become a worry for me. Obviously there are other causes of coma, but uh, here's, here's one that I would be thinking about. Really. There's no argument that the phenomenon is real. Uh, and depending on which side of the Atlantic you do your studies will influence how commonly you see it. The risk factors are clearly defined, uh, and the number one risk factor relates to excessive drinking. Um, other features associated with this position to this are uh, gen generally uh, towards the slower end of the field uh, and the consumption of anti-inflammatory medications. And I was very pleased to see that on your first aid list <laughs> that wasn't there. And I don't know whether it's because that's what you do or because you knew I'd be here. <laughs> but whatever. You won't get any anti-inflammatories from me. It's certainly associated with this phenomenon, probably associated with something else that we'll be talking about in a minute. Uh, drink my first, stay away from the anti-inflammatories. And there is no doubt that in parts of the world where, um, where you uh, uh, follow a fluid strategy uh, of drinking by thirst rather than keeping ahead, this phenomenon is much less common. So, to make my point, uh, here, here is a comparison of the data from the West Highland Way race in 2009 of finishing sodium levels uh, with those from a uh, friend and colleague of mine in the United States who was doing the same with me as the, West, the Western States endurance. So, uh, I hope you can all see that the finishing sodiums in the West Highland Way race run at a higher level than the finishing sodiums in the Western States in general. Is that? Can you just look at that? We've only got one low sodium in 2009, and this individual had a low sodium at the start of the race, and that low sodium was due to a phenomenon other than EAH. So take that away. That's not EAH. That was the same as the sodium was before. So there were no EAHs in 2009 amongst the, amongst the, the finishers. But if you look at the equivalent in the United States, and if you take normal sodium as 135, you've got 19 people finishing the race with low sodium. Now fortunately, uh, none of them were particularly symptomatic from their low sodium, but that strikes me as uh, a matter of good luck. Okay. I'd rather see sodium levels like we had in 2009. But don't get me wrong, we have had serious uh, hyponatremia in the West Highland Way race, uh, and there was a, um, a West Highland Way race healthy finisher of last year who had serious hyponatremia in a different event. And he did not fit the standard billing of being one of the tail end runners. He was an elite uh, forefront runner, and that's most unusual. So you're not excluded from having uh, low sodium if you're at the, at the uh, lead of the pack, but you are protected. So having told you that break muscle breakdown was universal, and it is, uh, and normally you live to tail the tail, all you get is achy muscles. Every now and again it all goes wrong, and those muscle breakdown products uh, cause a whole host of, of uh, unpleasant things. Uh, <coughs> most commonly, clogging of your kidneys. And if that happens, then, uh, then you, uh, you, you, such urine as you do pass, and you may not pass much, or you may not pass any. Such urine as you do pass is usually very dark colored, looking like chocolate. But uh, more worrying still uh, is the failure to pass urine at all. And we've had this in the West Highland Way race, and the last one. 2006-2007. The uh, last one didn't come to light uh, until the Monday when it was apparent to the poorly feeling, vomiting individual that urine wasn't being passed uh, and he took himself along to the hospital near his home, uh, which was a long way from me uh, and uh, the reality of what was going on was picked up. So the slight worry about this is that it may not become obvious that you're not passing the urine you should be until substantially after the race. So. 
I always breathe a sigh of relief when I hear folk are passing normal amounts of clear urine. And if that's not the case, then you need to sing out. And the diagnosis, your kidneys are not working, can't really be made other than by drawing a blood sample and, and finding out what the kidneys are doing that way. But this is real. Uh, we've had two cases of kidney failure since my involvement in the West Highland Way race, although fortunately the kidneys have sprung back to life after appropriate treatment. But such is not guaranteed. Now, so this is what I call pathological rhabdomyolysis, as opposed to just the isolated uh, elevation of creatinine kinase that I showed you in the earlier slide. And this phenomenon, I would say, is less preventable uh, than hyponatremia. But there is one or two things that I think you can do to improve your odds. Uh, and, and one is, again, I think uh, the consumption of anti-inflammatories is an associated factor. Uh, we know that there uh, uh, anti-inflammatories potentially damaging to the kidneys. I think you should stay off them uh, for the duration of the race. Heat stroke. Now here's a nasty beastie that so far I've never seen and I hope I never do. And I made the point earlier that uh, uh, elevated core temperature alone is not heat stroke. Uh, but heat stroke needs to include some element of knocked offness, knocked offness uh, uh, up top. So if you've got that uh, in association with an elevated core temperature, then it's appropriate to consider this phenomenon. Uh, and those of us involved in, in, in events of this nature make no apology for maybe over-diagnosing or over-suspecting this, because it's better to do that and have cooled people that you didn't need to than wait for folks to become seriously ill and then initiate treatment there. That's, that said, having, having indicated that, I, that, uh, that I'm ready to cool uh, Hat. So far, I haven't done it. But for those of you who think that the two boxes of ice sit outside the Kinnock Even uh, Community Centre for putting on sprained ankles, that's not why they're there. <laughs> uh, I live in dread of the day that I've got to put ice in polythene bags and wrap one of you in it, but that's what the ice is there for. The phenomenon actually is very similar to uh, what anaesthetists may encounter as a very unpleasant reaction exposure to some anaesthetic drugs. So that's all I propose saying about the nasty uh, generalised conditions uh, which are life-threatening. There's one or two things that I'd like to say about some other conditions which cause localised problems. And uh, although I haven't encountered that from the, uh, this one from the race, this is the one that worries me most. So it's the localised swelling within a group of muscles which is enclosed with a, within a sinew envelope uh, called fascia and the swelling causes intense pain uh, and compression of this bundle of, of, of uh, vessels and nerves. Um, and if you aren't onto it quickly, the pressure on those muscles becomes so great that the muscle, muscles die and become useless and just have to be removed. Um, and it's a hard one to diagnose early. Really. And really the only symptom of this phenomenon is pain disproportionate to any other identifiable cause. So if you think that's what's going on uh, uh, in a muscle group of the legs, then you need to sing out, it needs to be suspected early. And it does worry you making this diagnosis uh, in, in a whole host of runners who universally have sore legs. <laughs> <laughs> One of the many challenges. Um, here's another phenomenon which uh, is as likely to be encountered in training as it is in the rates of stress fracture. Now, stress fractures from running um, by far, by far and away, the commonest two stress fractures uh, affect the, uh, the metatarsals. And here, you see that one there? Perhaps the second metatarsal so called March fracture, maybe, maybe the kind of predominant fracture in, in walkers, and it got its name March fracture from the Roman soldiers. Uh, and the other stress fracture affecting the main bone of the shin, the tibia. So between those two bones, uh, they, they uh, consume the vast majority of, of uh, stress fractures, uh, such that um, stress fractures anywhere else are uncommon. But of the, of the uncommon stress fractures, the number three is the, uh, the smaller the shin bones of four. Finally, uh, here, here are two, uh, two common uh, soft tissue phenomena. Uh, we see oodles of these, and I do my best to try and patch them up uh, and enable folk to run on. And I appreciate that what I've offered is not, is not the best. Um, well, it's not perfect, but it is the best I can come up with to enable people with that kind of thing, they cannot even, to get to the end of the race. Uh, uh, I've tried to get advice from 
folk who run the daily blister clinics at the Marathon des Sables, uh, their doctors have got back to me. Uh, so you have to make do with what I offer. It's the best I can come up with. It's supposed to stay on, it's supposed to be manageable, and hopefully get folk with things like that from Kinloch even to the end of the race. Now, I had two of these uh, in my involvement in the race this painful redness uh, on the lower leg. Uh, and I have to say, I'm not awfully sure what it is. I've asked a few colleagues for their comment, and this is what they'll say. Cellulitis, or a soft tissue infection. Now, I'm a GP in my day job, and I see quite a lot of that. And I think I can recognise the symptoms. It's often sore, uh, the patients feel slightly unwell, and there's usually some portal of entry for the germ somewhere down, say, athlete's foot between the toes, or, some, or something has happened whereby you can see where the germ got it. Now, they are sore, but it isn't agonising. Whereas the two, that I've, two of these phenomena that I've seen in the race, both people have been much more sore than I've seen in, uh, in, in the soft tissue infection counterpart in the non-athletic population. Now, maybe because uh, the, you're trying to run on it, uh, which makes something that the ordinary population can cope with the pain into something unbearable. But I'm not sure. The other, the other thing is it doesn't quite fit with runners in this red phenomenon on, on the front of the leg is that, that in neither case was there an obvious portal of entry for, uh, for the organism. No split skin between the toes of athlete's foot where germs have got in. No huge uh, blisters on the feet where the bugs have got in. So I don't know what this is, but it happens from time to time and it seems to uh, both uh, individuals end up in hospital on, on a concoction of antibiotics and, and painkillers on which they settle. But the phenomenon, as far as I'm concerned, remains somewhat unexplained. But the worry, again, um, that these people will come to me before there's redness, the two worries on my mind, is this some uh, manifestation of rhabdomyolysis? Uh, is this uh, compartment syndrome? Or I suppose, given the location of the pain before it comes red, is this a stress fracture of the tibia? And again, not an easy call. So there we are, that's me. Here are my conclusions. Um, we heard a little bit about camelbacks, but not too much. Uh, I think I make my point uh, about um, drinking large quantities of fluids uh, and the potentially damaging effect. Um, and so in summary, therefore, uh, have a read of the, guide, the guidelines. I've uh, stuck them on the website. They're a bit old now, um, and maybe I should update them, but they still hold good. Drink by first, stay away from the anti inflammatories. If you can monitor your weight, uh, wearing the same clothes each time, all well and good. Uh, I've, I've made a point that I'm actually more concerned about weight gain than I am about weight loss. Uh, there seems to be little doubt that uh, those who lose a lot of weight can cope with losing a lot of weight, whereas weight gain uh, can be associated with more harmful eventualities. I don't accept the existence of this phenomenon. I don't know what that is. You read about it, you hear about it, maybe someone should tell me about it. It's like Dehydration, well it does happen, uh, but if somebody is unwell, then uh, I think it's more likely to be one of the entities we've already spoke about. I certainly wouldn't make dehydration my first diagnostic port call. If you ever end up needing medical help, uh, it's quite likely if you leave, leave the immediate environment of the race, you'll be seeing someone who has no idea about the specific challenges of running uh, 100 miles. And you may, may as well take your guidelines with you, because that will be about as much as the person who you did before then. And if you're passing urine, um, take some of that as well. Uh, certainly, if you end up in a unit where they want rush you to stick a drip up, um, that's potentially dangerous because uh, it's the commonest pathological cause of problems as we've agreed with fluid overload. And I would want to make sure that I wasn't fluid overload before someone poured fluid into me. Uh, so, that's my final point. No IV fluids without initially a sodium. It's likely as not, your sodium will be low. And obviously, you've heard pouring in of watery fluid when your sodium is already low is to make it even lower. And that's not good. So that's me.